I'm Joe Devine and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. Today I was joined by Seb stafford Blor. We talked about Dimitar Berbatov off the back of an article that Seb wrote for TIFOFootball.com. The article was about the perception of Dimitar Berbatov from the perspective of Spurs fans since he's left and what effect a player can have on the crowd when he doesn't leave a legacy like in the case of players like Modric or Gareth Bale but is a player that people genuinely enjoy watching. So Dimitar Berbatov, stick around for that. Before that, uh, I spoke to Josh Schneiderweiler, who is the host of a new podcast that we will be starting as of January in 2018. The podcast is called This Football Life. Josh has been recording a version of it for the last few months under the name of the Football Autobiography Show, but we liked it so much that we've asked him to come and do it for us uh, under this new name as a second TIFO podcast. Uh, So I'm going to speak to him now very briefly about that to give us some idea of what we can expect from it. And after that, I'll be back with Seb. Thanks for downloading the episode and uh, see you all again next week. Okay, so we're joined by Josh now, uh, who as of January 2018, in case you were confused, uh, is going to be joining the TIFO ranks with uh, the the second of what will then be our three podcasts. And the podcast is called This Football Life, um, and in it Josh will be talking to various people who have made their careers in football, be it as a player uh, or as a physio in the case of one of the first two episodes or uh, in in another role within the industry. Um, so I'm going to chat to, to Josh briefly now about what we can expect from the, the show. So Josh, have, have I explained that well? Uh, yeah, you, you nailed it pretty dead on right there. You know, there's so many people in the football industry who, who we don't see except, you know, for maybe a cutaway on sitting on the bench, um, but who live very interesting lives. I mean, you mentioned the physio, so the, the second episode is with Rob Swire, who was the physio at Manchester United from 1991 to 2014. And, you know, most people don't really know much about the physio. So we, you know, spent an hour going in depth, talking about all of those things. What happens when the physio runs on the field? What's the first thing he asks? You know, and and things like that. And of course, we get into interesting stories. And it's really a behind the scenes look at the people that make up the football industry from players, coaches, but also physios. We have an eight, you know, agents as well, executives, scouts. So, you know, we touch all the bases and it's a real behind the scenes look at the football world. What is the first thing a physio asks? Uh, well, the first thing the physio asks, so you, he, one of the things was shocking was he told me how often you have to ask actually what is injured. He's like, because he, what he said was there was countless times where, you know, he thought it was an a- ankle and it was actually a knee and he right. would, he would start, he would start treating the wrong, <laughs> the wrong part of the body. And so, so the first thing you always have to ask, you have to ask is, what what is actually injured which is not something you'd imagine but um no i, know that I guess yeah. when a doctor says where does it hurt that's sort of the same thing i suppose in a way yeah ex- exactly but you'd be surprised by i guess how many times like someone's holding the knee but it really means that the ankle's injured or, or something so oh, yeah interesting. and you've recorded uh, a fair few episodes before we got in touch with you as well you'd been uh, operating the podcast which, which will essentially be a very a very similar a very similar tone as the, the one you were recording before called the football autobiography show so i wanted to ask you a little bit about about that and uh, who what was your favorite interview from that what was your favorite experience of recording that show ah oh, there's just so many um that, so they were all like little mini autobiographies that's why i called it the football autobiography show there's just so many i mean one um that just stands out immediately was uh, i interviewed a, a player um an american player um who came out with this book, um, and uh, I, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Oh, Bobby Warshaw, okay. Mm. And um, he, re- he wrote the most introspective autobiography I I've, I've, think I've read since, like, Andre Agassi is open. And he, you know, he dives into, like, sexuality and, like, is it, like, are people in the football world, can they be gay? Right. And, like, and he talks about his own experiences, and um, it... it he opens up in a way that other 
players uh, have. And, and then James Montague, who I know he, you had uh, on, you know, doing a little uh, billionaire's owners. Um, He's a podcast regular now. Yeah. And so he, I mean, he was fantastic telling stories of going to Western Sahara and, and playing in the desert there. And I mean, there's just so many interesting people um, that, you know, live such interesting lives. I mean, actually, the, the other one that comes to mind is I interviewed um, this author, Dave Thomas, who's written 18 books about Burnley. I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> Um, but you know, he's kind of, you know, made his retired life about being an author about Burnley and like the foremost wow. Burnley writer, you know, what's the spread there? What, what is, is he choosing? Is he attacking a different angle every time or is he writing books about specific seasons? So a couple of them are seasons. A couple of them are anthologies, like, you know, mashups of, uh, different like articles that, you know, other writers have had and, um, also, a lot of them are like autobiographies, um, and and then also biographies, and uh, just all over. I mean, uh, you'd be amazed at how much you could write about one club. Um, but he he did, and he did it really well, and just a fascinating guy. Okay, so the podcast is going to be available from the first week of January. Um, also, it's probably a good time to mention that. Uh, last week, uh, Alex and I talked about the possibility of uh, starting a, a tactics-only podcast as well, and uh, there was a very positive response to that, so we're going to press ahead with that as well. Not entirely sure what format it's going to take as it stands, so we're going to have a bit more of a chat about it, um, and hopefully it'll launch around the same time, possibly a little bit, little bit later um, than Josh's show. But this Football Life, uh, it's going to be a TIFO podcast, we're really excited about it, um, and we'll be sure to tell you lots more about it uh, as and when uh, it is appropriate. Josh, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Dimitar Berbatov is a bit of, maybe an enigma's too strong a word for him, but he was certainly a player who was, maybe maybe you would describe him as, as, as a luxury. Uh, I'm not sure. How, how, do you, how do you see him generally, Seb? Uh, yeah, I agree. I think, I think Enigma is a, a description which is banded about far too, far too regularly. Um, I, think, I think, to me, he was someone that um, unfortunately knew exactly how gifted he was um, in the sense that he, um, I mean, his technique was so extravagant and his first touch was so, so good and, and his, you know, his ball striking ability was often just uh, you know, uh, flawless. That he didn't, he didn't compensate in other areas as a less talented player might have done. So you know, he, he didn't work hard without the ball. He wasn't always, uh, you know, when, when he surrendered possession, he wasn't always the first to sort of uh, to try and win it back. Um, I think I think more than I, I think he's really a supporters player though, Joe. I think he's one of those guys that um, it's a little bit of a, a, a trite observation and, and definitely a cliche, but um, he's someone that you pay your money to go and watch. You mentioned his work rate there, and that that's always interested me because you know he like some other players. I suppose Mesut Özil is someone else you could consider who also potentially fits into that luxury player role. Uh, there are players who have a more languid style. And uh, I suppose there's two sides of the fence, really, that, that supporters or onlookers can sit there. One of which is to say he's not working hard enough, and that's clear from a lack of running or you know a slower movement generally. Another is to say that he's more intelligent or has a slightly different style of play, or that you know when when he turns on the pace, he might surprise defenders. It sounds it sounds from what you're saying like you think it might be uh, the the former, in that he was maybe just not working as hard as he could have. Yeah, I, I think that there might be a simplification there because I, I think what you definitely say is I'm not sure Berbatov would have been any better had he worked any harder, uh, which which sounds like a sort of a, a contradiction. But is the way he played the game, what he did with the ball, the way he he I mean, for instance, the the partnership he had with Robbie Keane at Tottenham is a classic example of this. Didn't really depend on on sort of um, you know uh, muscle jarring work rate or you know, energy sapping runs into channels. It was more a, yeah. I mean, I, I the the Özil thing is is interesting because I I, I think what, what you'd say with him is not if he worked harder would he better be, would he be a better player. It's if he worked harder or if he gave the perception of working harder would he be um, would the team as a whole, for instance, sort of Arsenal's high press, would that be stronger? Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, for, for Berbatov, Tottenham didn't really play like that. Tottenham didn't, uh, under Martin Yole, didn't rely, and you know, uh, certainly not under one day Ramos, didn't rely on any kind of high pressing. That they are not the Tottenham that they are today. Um, and so it was more of a kind of 
Um, I think sort of the, the, the flaws in Berbatov's game only really became relevant when he moved to a bigger club, when he moved to a club who were you know, regularly competing in the Champions League and at the top of the Premier League. Um, is that what is that what happened when he moved to Manchester United? I don't know. I, I, I think um, I think two things happened. I think possibly a little bit of that. I think that um, he, if you look back um, at the sort of the the characters that Alex Ferguson got the most out of, they generally don't fit the sort of the the Berbatov mould. And maybe you could make an argument for saying that, that Dwight York was quite a laid back character, but not in the same way. It didn't manifest in the same way as a player. Um, I think with well, the, other, the other comparison I was going to make would, would have been potentially Eric Cantona in some ways, but maybe more stylistically. I think Eric Cantona, first and foremost, Cantona was a winner. I mean, uh, Cantona, Cantona was a competitor, and, and, and um, I don't think, I, I mean, it's it, it very hard to, to sort of surmise what he was as a footballer, but I certainly, I wouldn't necessarily compare him to Berbatov. I think he... Um, technically, but there, were, there were similarities in terms of audaciousness. Yeah, I, I I'd agree with that. What they yeah. would attempt. Yeah, and also sort of their their technique and their first touches, and you know how they saw the pitch around them. Yeah, there, there, were, there were definitely similarities there. But I think the main the main problem for Berbatov was that um, whilst he he kind of outwardly seemed to resent um, the lack of talent around him at Spurs, because you know Robbie Keane aside and Aaron Lennon occasionally and Jermaine Genius, you know, he he was he was probably held back by the the kind of the, the overall quality of that team and, and you know its um uh, its flaws. I think when he got to Manchester United, um, the idea of being one of many to him, of no longer being a special player, uh, seemed to chisel away at his ego a little bit. And he's a player that needs to perform his ultimate self self belief. Um, and so when he got there and you know competing with some of the players who obviously were still at Old Trafford at the time. Um, he was never going to be the focal point. Well, it was an incredible forward uh, forward line at the time as Absolutely. well. I mean, he would have been playing with Ronaldo, Rooney, and Tevez, you know, in front of Ryan Giggs, Paul Scholes. I mean, it's it's probably one of the, the strongest we've seen for a while. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, 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 I um, I think there are certain players who thrive on being, well, who thrive on knowing that sort of, you know, the team wins and loses on on what they do. Um, and Martin Yell's Tottenham were very much set up. To, um, to to play through Berbatov. Um, everything they did in the forward department, okay, they they, they played with a sort of fairly basic formation. And they were reliant on um, on two wide players, one cutting in, one one down the touchline. But a lot of what they did centrally came through Berbatov. He wasn't a line leading player. He was someone who would always drop deep into the play. You know, and um, yeah, it's why you know, Robbie Keane had the season he did. It's why Jermaine Genus had such a good run. Because they had someone like that around them that, that used the ball so well and could manipulate space as well as he did. Conversely, though, you you could also say, um, and I, I watched a um, a video last night of all of of Berbatov's goals for Spurs, mm-hmm. which I realise is not a very good way <laughs> of praising mm-hmm. a player. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the things I noticed was that he had an extraordinarily high proportion of of ridiculous goals. You know, I, I think I think there was a forty seven or something and that included all of. His goals in Europe, of which there were many in the Euro- the Europa League, I think, from that first season with Spurs. Um, but uh, you know, they had a high proportion of goals that he hadn't necessarily made on his own, but that he'd he'd sort of snatched out of nothing. You know, improbable angles uh, and a, a lot of I'm not sure what to call them, but those they're not quite overhead kicks, but those sort of swivel kicks, of which there are a few, uh, where he just turns almost 180 degrees uh, in midair and, and volleys the ball. You know, that, those are incredible, but. Like any good striker, a lot. I mean, the, probably the majority of his goals, not necessarily tap-ins, but were put on a plate by players like Robbie Keane and Jermaine Genus, and you you really could see um, their contribution to that as well. So I won. I wonder, as a as a player, is he making the team around him better, or or is he really you know the focal point in that sort of isolated way? It's really hard to say. I mean, because obviously. Tottenham had their limitations during his time and they didn't actually, I mean, they won the League Cup, but as a whole, um, they didn't achieve anything as a result of him being there. And they didn't really, you know, his, in, in, in the way that, for instance, you know, Gareth Bale's time at Tottenham ended with a, you know, an enormous transfer to Real Madrid and a vast transfer revenue. And then the influx of a new group of players, that's kind of a legacy. Berbatov doesn't really have a legacy at Spurs other than the memories of what he did. Um the point you make about sort of the style of goal is very interesting because there's there's a weird dichotomy between the very simple and the ridiculous. Um, there was a goal he scored at Middlesbrough, um, 
on the last day of, I think, the 2007-2008 season, um, where the ball was, uh, I think Hossam Ghali um, squared the ball to him, and he was, he was just standing probably about five yards outside the penalty box. And he could take a touch, he could push the ball out wide to an overlapping player. I think Steve Malbrant was on the left-hand side that day. Um, but instead, he just he just executes this perfect falling volley. Um, and Berbatov, I, I think it's one of the things that makes Berbatov really easy to love is in that he sort of he played with this sort of love for the aesthetic, as if the way the game was played mattered to him. And I think at the time, given what Tottenham's imperatives were, you know, they they wanted to be in the Champions League, but it wasn't a sort of a do or die situation. It was a kind of pipe dream. I think that was I I, I think that made him that was a kind of compensation for any any sort of you know um, what are we going to achieve what are we going to do what are we, what are we going to be able to do next season how can we build around him I'm quite certain he did make the players around him better but I think more importantly he made that team much more fun to watch I think in a, in a lot of uh, certain not necessarily all of his goals but a lot of his uh, attempts as well it it looks like someone who's having fun with football and also someone who's totally fearless and that I think I, I often find that, that those players are the most entertaining to watch particularly when they're playing up front if they're happy to take risks and that that's one of the reasons that you know alongside the fact obviously that that he had talent why Ronaldo was so exciting and, and is so exciting to watch because he's prepared to take risks and prepared to look stupid in ways that perhaps other more functional forwards aren't and I think when you get them right you know Berbatov had for me a lot of stylistic similarities to Robin Van Persie as well in that sort of incisive straight cutting as you say that often perfect angles a lot of shots on the volley that sort of thing and there's there's a there's a special magic I suppose around watching players like that where you you can almost you know forget the importance of the game they just look like they're having fun I think um it's interesting you bring that up because I I think the moment that sums that up best is the penalty he took in the league cup final um and obviously, uh, Tottenham were one 0 down at the moment. It's a highly pressurised situation. Uh, you're facing Peter Cech, who was and remains one of the, the best goalkeepers in Europe. And the penalty he takes is just absurd. I mean, he's, he scores, of course, but it's just it's it, it's a moment which which kind of characterised both sort of best because it just shows that he exists in a slightly different mental space to most other players. Because you <laughs> you sort of okay you you. In that situation, you'd imagine a lot of players would have opted for power, put their head over the ball and just opted, you know, just made sure they got a good, good contact. Um, Berbatov has this weird shuffling. It's like he's taking a penalty in training. Um, and um, I think it, 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 Peter Jury did, actually did, um, I know a lot of, he's a, it's a bit of a divisive character um, as a commentator, but his commentary of that moment was wonderful. Uh, he's talking about Berbatov scoring with such impotent ease. And it, it is, it, it's just, it was. A very strange, a very strange moment because I remember watching it and the, feeling the tension of it and seeing his response to it. The whole thing was very incongruous, and um, and and yeah, I, I think it sort of um, yeah, it just showed him for what he was in the you know a special player just had a complete conviction in in what he could do with the football. That reminds me a little bit of um, a Doug Stan. Do you know who Doug Stanhope is? I do. American stand-up comedian. Yeah. Um, he's 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 a very funny guy, and he's he's got this bit about home advantage. He's a big American football fan, okay. and uh, he says one of his best ideas that no one's no one's thought of before is uh, why is home advantage a thing in American football? Because you know there's so many fans of the opposing team, the away team maybe. Uh, get a little bit nervous or feel the tension. He says, "Why don't you just hire a, a team of uh, of psychopaths and uh, <laughs> w- w- watch them play without without pressure?" And it does. It makes you think that you know when you see players and Ber- Berbatov's a good example. There there are plenty of others, and as you say, they they appear even even to you know us normal normal folk to exist on some other ethereal plane. Uh, but they 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 seem to have no. I don't know capacity to feel that the pressure of the situation they look completely relaxed they feel completely confident at all times and I think it you know as as anyone listening to this podcast will know when you find yourself in a tense situation I think the reason they're called it's called a tense situation is because your body has a tendency to tense up and there are players like Berbatov where that just doesn't seem to happen he seems as languid yeah. as ever you know and that uh, again that I think that contributes to to making him an exciting player to watch yeah absolutely we touched on Manchester United already and I actually remember his transfer on the final day uh, of of the transfer window as the first sort of transfer deadline day 
uh, 24-hour news thing that I'd watched because uh, I think uh, it was it must have either I must have uh, moved moved out of home. I was living in a, in a pub uh, and uh, they had we had the TV on. I remember staying up after my shift to watch it happen. Um, but he he moved quite late. He moved to Manchester United. There was a lot of positivity around it. He was obviously very expensive at the time. And in some ways, he to me, he seemed like the sort of player that Alex Ferguson would go for in that he had a bit of attitude, he had quite a lot of style, and there was already so many uh, fantastic forwards at the team that maybe what they wanted was that extra little bit of clinical edge. It didn't quite work out. Uh, he was there for four years. He scored, you know, fairly decent return. He scored something, 57 goals, something like that. Um, but why why do you think it, it, it didn't work out for him, Seb? And do you, do you think if he hadn't left Manchester United, he could he could have sorry if he hadn't left Tottenham, or if he'd moved somewhere else, he could have reached some other peak, or was he already at his peak at Tottenham? I think it was mental, Joe. I think I think one of the, the difficulties he encountered at United is that he wasn't guaranteed a place in the team. Um, I think I mean it's it's very hard for anyone other than than the player himself to answer this, but it just appeared as if um, something about playing on that stage with those players and for that side. Um, chipped away at, yeah, again, his belief. Um, and when you've got a player whose entire game is underpinned by just sort of unwavering conviction, um, then when that happens, you've got a little bit of a problem. I also think, I mean, something which has been overlooked, I think, is, is that stylistically, I know Ferguson probably looked at Berbatov and saw Cantona or saw shades of Cantona in it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's obviously completely forgivable. Um, but I don't think he was necessarily the right player to play with some of those some some of these sort of the incumbent members of that side. If you remember some of the kind of the the best goals, for instance, some of the best combinations between players like Ronaldo and Rooney, and um, I'm thinking specifically of that goal of the Emirates in the in the Champions League. Um, yeah. But they scored quite a few goals like that. That was a United team who liked to play Very with pace. Fast pace. They had a, they yeah. had a fast break in them. They didn't play on the counter attack, but they had that gear, and I think Berbatov. Berbatov was always, always a little bit of a slowdown player. I mean, you might you might call it indulgence, but he was he was someone who liked the ball at his feet. He wasn't, I mean, capable of playing a one touch pass or a flick or you know a, a through ball, but sort of liked to dwell on the ball. And, and I think he was sort of. It's like if you've got an orchestra and one instrument has been tuned slightly different to all the rest. Um, doesn't make the instrument any worse or inferior it's just that it doesn't quite all fit together and I think that was a problem and I, I, I think it became a um, I think it became a, a little bit of a vicious cycle in the sense that he you know, that that issue existed so he wasn't um, guaranteed a place in the team and because he wasn't guaranteed in the place in the team he didn't necessarily always have the the, 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 the confidence to adapt in the way that he needed to that's a guess, and that's just a theory. But it just it just seemed that way. And I, you know, what what seems to contradict that is that he scored an awful lot of goals for Man United. Um, yeah. I mean, he he superficially he did very well, but I think he did a lot of multiples though, a lot of a few braces, a couple of hat tricks. He did a bit um, of stat having. Yeah. Y- yes. Yeah, I, yes, I think so. I, I, no, I definitely agree with that. And I, I just think that um, anyone who watched him at Tottenham, and I mean not just on TV, anyone who, who was actually in the ground and saw him on those, you know. Uh, on those Europa League nights or UEFA Cup as it was then, um, you know, and some of the lesser Premier League games, no one, n- none of those people would, would sort of would claim that what happened to Manchester United was was the equivalent. I mean, it was a it was a different player. Still, someone who produced nice moments. There's always that um, that little drag back on the on the goal line that, that sort of reappears on Twitter every now and again. A wonderful bit of skill. But then at Spurs, you see not necessarily something like that. You know, identically like that every week, but you see something that you could take away. I mean, I, I think beyond all the goals and all the moments, I think that, that what, what I remember about watching Berbatov live was that when he used to say someone sort of launched a fifty-yard crossfield pass to him and he took it out of the air, I always remember the noise the crowd used to make when he made yeah. that first touch, and it was just something so it, you know had no real relevance to the rest of the game, and, and it it probably wouldn't even make like a match day highlights package. But it was just this sort of this kind of very um, primitive appreciation for a, for a basic part of the game. That he just, God, it was uh, yeah, amazing. I think it, it, to to, to um, bring it back to what you were saying about Manchester United as well. I think uh, it's an an interesting point to consider that 
they were in a position where, as you say, they they had the ability to break fast. They weren't necessarily a counter attacking team, but playing against, uh, I suppose you know, back back in the days before Ferguson left, many teams would come to Old Trafford and, and set up very defensively. Yeah. And I think they had they struggled at times throughout the latter stages of Fergie's career to break down teams like that. They didn't really have those players, and so bringing in someone who, as you say, plays at a bit of a slower pace is potentially more incisive. Doesn't rely solely on pace. Um, <clears throat> to to, uh, to to finish off moves um, was an important was, was an important player to bring in for the club, but that would you know that would mean that he wasn't necessarily playing every game, and it would also mean that in potentially some of the bigger games that he wouldn't he wouldn't be the focal point. So it's I suppose it's taking on more of a of a bit part role as well, and as you say, not being not being the focal point like he was at Spurs. In fact, we're talking about him like he. he uh, he's not playing anymore. He is playing. Uh, he plays. In, he plays for Kerala Blasters. Uh, although he's only played three times, hasn't scored any goals. Um, but after Manchester United, he, he moved to Fulham. Where actually, incidentally, um, Joe, he did actually very well at Fulham. I mean, Fulham were a far worse team than the, than the Spurs side he left. And yet, um, uh, there was something about being again that character in that kind of side that sort of seemed to 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 catalyze something inside him. I mean, he, he, you could see, you know, from his body language, the way he played, the way he re- responded to the players around him, he enjoyed being that person, even though he wasn't playing at the same level again. Um, very interesting to watch that. And also, uh, we should we should uh, say, from a national team point of view, uh, he was he was fantastic for Bulgaria. Yeah. And he scored 48 goals in, in, in 78 caps, which is quite a good return. And that's during a, you know, I mean, this is not the sort of the, the Bulgaria that got to the semi-final of the 94 World Cup. This is an altogether different kind of side. I mean, he, mm. he sort of um, he, uh, he he wasn't playing. I mean, the, the couple of players like Martin Petrov was a very good player, but you know, he wasn't playing alongside um, sort of an elite generation. So the article you wrote is is, a, is about the perception mainly from from Tottenham fans. You know, you compare him to players like. Uh, Gareth Bale and and Modric, you say it's just slightly different in the sense that he didn't leave a legacy and Tottenham didn't win anything whilst he was there, but that there's the ability for fans, you know, now that some time has passed, to remember him as a special player, someone who is exciting to watch, a fans player, as you called him. If you could broaden that slightly, would you say the same uh, for for his for his career generally? Do, how how do you think he'll be remembered in ten years' time? It's hard. It's a really hard question because I, I think we're living in an era where. Um, the standard has gone through the stratosphere I mean, in terms of you've got two players who belong in, an, in a category not only entirely of their own but one that didn't previously exist and so I wouldn't place I wouldn't obviously place Berbatov anywhere near either of those and I wouldn't necessarily put him in the category which goes beneath them the sort of the um, the one that's just sort of currently inhabited by players like Eden Hazard and previously by um, Frank Ribery and Aaron Robin and you know that kind of stuff I, I don't know. I, I just it's also trying to trying to rate him in a sort of you know a, 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 as part of a ranking system. It's almost to defeat the object because it's as if Berbatov didn't really stand for kind of um, you know sort of more traditional football imperatives. It's a sort of he. So for me to say that he he kind of um, yeah. I, I, so I, in, in terms of sounds an awful lot like you're calling him an enigma, Seb. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can not to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I. I think he'll just be remembered. It's, this is going to sound terribly pretentious. He's going to be remembered for for being a very joyful player, for being mm. someone that you again you just wanted to go and watch. Um, and I think that's quite interesting because it's almost it's, it's sort of an, uh, makes him almost an anachronism. Because I think a lot of players now, the game is built on on, on physical uh, strength and power and athleticism, you know, and and tactical rigidity. And so to find a player like him who 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 performed with a sort of a, a sense of joy um, is quite rare. Um, and I, I think that helps him. I think that I, I, I think but I don't know how Berbatov will be remembered, but I think the point here is that he will be for a very long time because he's he's the kind of player that doesn't die. He's the sort of player, for instance, that in 40, 50 years' time, people who were at White Hart Lane um, you know, sort of circa 2007, 2006, they'll be telling their grandchildren about. Not things like him lifting trophies or, you know, glorious marches into European Cups or Premier League titles, but just, as I did earlier, they'll talk about a touch and they'll talk about swivelling volleys. They'll talk about that weird falling, 
yeah, falling half volley at um, falling volley at um, at Middlesbrough, um, and uh, yeah, I, I or a preposterous goal he scored in North London derby actually, which seems even now it's a it's a very strange one. He's almost on the goal line when he when he shoots, and he just sort of seems to to cut. I think it was um, Manuel and Almunia in half with this. Yeah, <laughs> half the, for, for, there was about five seconds after that where nobody in the stadium apart from him really knew what had happened, and then the ball was just in the net. Very strange. They'll talk about him like that. They'll talk talk about him anecdotally. So that they'll they'll remember his actions possibly rather than his achievements. Yeah, for sure. Because I don't think anyone will, will remember. They won't quote his statistics. They won't say, "Oh, I remember when he scored X amount of goals in X amount of games," or you know, um, or what his strike rate was through a particular month of the season or anything like that. It'll just be sort of this big lump of kind of uh, extravagant football that that, that that people cherish. Seb, thanks very much uh, for joining us and we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, Joe.